Okay, so we always talk about foreshadowing and how Oda is, well, I'm sorry, Goda is the best at doing this. Where even in the most recent chapter, 1021, there was somewhat foreshadowing from the cover story from chapter 310. So now, I feel like it was the perfect time to talk about Oda's best foreshadowing, or just foreshadowing in general. Things in the story that we probably missed that came back around and was like, okay, that was obvious. Why did we not catch that? But quick disclaimer though, foreshadowing technically is just an indication of a future event or point. So even just mentioning the four emperors before their debut, that's technically foreshadowing, but it's not that impressive. So we're going to focus on foreshadowing that most of us specifically didn't pay attention to, or we thought it was meaningless the first time around and can almost exclusively be picked up in retrospect by just rereading. A silhouette or just mentioning a character's name only to reveal them later is something Oda does a lot, but we're not going to include those here either. So let's start. Fishman Island's number one swordsman, and this is chapter 84. This is in Arlong Park. And Hachi made a statement that, you know, back then it didn't really matter to us because, hey, we're just reading the story. But now in hindsight, it definitely foreshadowed something or someone that was to come. In his fight versus Zoro, Hachi said, Did you know that aside from one man, I, Hachi, of the Six Sword style, am the number one swordsman in Fishman Island? Even if the heavens were to be flipped over, you would have no chance of beating me. In chapter 629 in Fishman Island, it was revealed that Hiozo is the strongest swordsman in Fishman Island, who coincidentally is also an octopus like Hachi. So then, everything from chapter 84 came back full circle and that man Hachi was talking about was Yozo. Something that we didn't care about, but in hindsight, Oda definitely foreshadowed his appearance. Next, we have Dragon being the supreme leader of the Revolutionary Army and Luffy's father. So, in chapter 96, Nami, while reading the newspaper, makes an offhand odd remark of the world being in turmoil and that Vida had just had a revolution. Only four chapters later, Dragon was introduced and we had no idea who he was. This newspaper, in retrospect, was a hint of him being a revolutionary. If you think this is a reach, Oda later confirmed in a data book this revolution was indeed caused by Dragon and his army. This was in the One Piece Yellow Grand Elements, page 208. It is revealed that the revolutionary army is behind the coup d'etat in Vida. Not only that, in the very same chapter 96 we had whoop slap saying that there's nothing good about having a criminal from your village referring to luffy but then proceeds to make this remark about luffy being fated to be a criminal or a pirate which leads me to believe that he was also simultaneously referring to dragon since he's also a criminal from the goa kingdom and also luffy's father which is why luffy is also fated to be just like him dragon of course was later revealed to be the leader of the revolutionary army and luffy's father in chapter 432 quick side note vira was actually the same place nolan arrived to 400 years ago so it's crazy how Oda didn't just forget about it and use it again. Next, the foreshadowing of a Straw Hat's musician. Since we're still on the topic of Luffy, something everyone thought was kind of a joke until it actually happened was Brook. Brook is the most foreshadowed crewmate and arguably the most important role to Luffy besides maybe a cook. Back in chapter 8 after Zoro joined, Luffy said, we need a cook and a musician. And of course, Zoro cuts him off and calls him an idiot, which at the time I think I did the same thing because I'm like, why the hell would you need a musician? Luffy again in chapter 22, right after Usopp joins, he says, hey, I just had an idea. There's still one crucial position of a pirate crew we need to fill before entering the Grand Line. Nami says, that's right. We do have that fantastic kitchen after all. Of course, I could do it as long as I get paid. Zoro says, an indispensable crew member for long voyages. Luffy says, you think so too, right? Yup, what a pirate ship crew really needs is a musician. <laughs> And then, of course, they go crazy on him. And Luffy's response is, but, but a pirate's got to sing. And we've heard Luffy singing before. Again, in chapter 94, after Nami officially joins, Luffy was asked if he had a doctor on the ship. Luffy answered and said, well, a doctor, huh? That's a good idea. But I think we need a musician first. <laughs> Luffy again was asked why. Well, because pirates gotta sing, you know? <laughs> again in chapter 303, before Water 7 and Frankie joining, Luffy said again, our next crew member will be a ship repairman. And then everyone was shocked that Luffy actually said something intelligent. Luffy then goes back to his dream of bringing a musician on his ship. So in chapter 443, when he found Brooke and he mentions that he's a musician, Luffy's eyes lit up and he literally was begging Brooke to be his Nakama. Since we're on a topic of Brook, this is probably a great segue where the Rumbar Pirates, Brook and Laboon. Brook and his crew. In chapter 103, the Rumbar Pirates are first referenced by Crocus in the Twin Capes. Crocus is saying long ago while he was minding his business as a lighthouse keeper, a certain group of friendly pirates came down Reverse Mountain. And then following their ship was a little baby whale, and that whale was Laboon. There's also the detail of Laboon coming from West Blue, where Brook is originally from. They even showed Captain Yorkie as a silhouette in this panel here. We also see the Rumbar Pirate ship and the flag and it was shown in a very small panel. The Brook and Laboon twist was later revealed in chapter 459, but Captain Yorkie didn't make his first official appearance in chapter 486. Next, Crocus as the ship's doctor. 
So again, a perfect segue. When we first meet Crocus, he mentions that he's a doctor. He kind of plays it off as a hobby, but then he kind of doubles down and says he used to run a clinic, even though he doesn't look like much. We now know in chapter 506 that really confirmed that Crocus did indeed work for the Pirate King's crew. We got information about the Pirate King's disease and finding out that Crocus was the one actually taking care of that was mind blowing. The fact that Brooke was already there as well, a part of the crew, top tier foreshadowing by Oda. Next, we have Sanji's origins. So Sanji was calling himself Mr. Prince in chapter 174. And now we know Sanji is one of the four princes of Derma 66. We will never forget that amazing scene with Crocodile and Sanji being Mr. Prince. I miss that so much. Jumping forward to chapter 228, Sanji does reveal that he is originally from the North Blue, and that is where Derma 66 ruled. In the chapter after that, 229, Cricket yells at the crew for not knowing the feelings of a child who was mocked and bullied simply for sharing their blood with someone else. And the very next panel, we get a shot of Sanji at the forefront. This panel tells us everything we need to know, of course, in hindsight. And then we can't forget about chapter 841, where we see everything that Sanji had been through with his brothers, and especially his father. And we can't forget in chapter 310, when Zoro and Sanji another moment, where Zoro calls Sanji the Prince of stupid kingdom, which I'm sure he'd rather be called that than a prince of the Derma kingdom. In chapter 101, this may be somewhat of a reach, but there's a conversation with Zoro talking about a ship going up a mountain. Sanji said he's heard a bit about it. Zoro says about the mountain, he says, no, I've heard things about the Grand Line. Now in chapter 841, we see that Derma 66 can actually climb the red line. Now finally in chapter 173, we get Sanji's Den Den Mushi and it shows Sanji hidden eyebrow spirals. The spirals on Sanji when tilted become inverted double sixes, whereas all his other siblings' eyebrows are tilted sixes, which represents the double six in Derma 66. And Sanji's the outcast because he's the opposite. Next, we have Conjuro. So for Conjuro, this is a very big one, right? Because for the most part, this is scattered over a span of 220 plus chapters. For Conjuro's introduction, in chapter 754, he was shown to be right-handed. However, whenever he drew, it was shown that he was drawing left-handed. In chapter 803, when he was drawing Rinosuke, again, he was using his left hand. In chapter 974, of course, we find out that Conjuro, he could draw very well, almost scarily well, but only when he's using his right hand and he was hiding his actual prowess. In chapter 746, every single important character was assigned a bounty, including all the present Straw Hats, the royal family members, Sabo, and even Kinemon, but no Conjuro. So Doflamingo, more than likely because of his smile business and his ties with Orochi and Kaido, he was probably informed of Conjuro and was told not to kill him maybe. In chapter 807 and onwards, Jack invades Zoe, claiming that he knows Raizo is there and that he was supposed to be there. Zunisha is also not an island that one can just come across, so it's constantly moving and tracking it is very hard. Jack was able to get there twice. It's later revealed, of course, that the person that gave all this to Jack was indeed Conjuro. In chapter 920, when Kinemon tells the story of how they came from the past, we see two birds flying out as soon as they arrived. Soon after, Orochi gets notified of the scabbers' presence, and we find out he got the message from those birds that Conjuro drew with his right hand. The birds are a much better drawn version of the bird he drew back in Dressrosa with the same exact color pattern. It's shown much more clearly in the anime. In chapter 934, Nami mentions wanting to go to the bathhouse in front of Conjuro. Immediately after in chapter 936, the bathhouse gets raided by Hawkins and Drake in suspicion of rebels being there. Coincidence? I think not! Furthermore, in chapter 959, Orochi, from the intel he received, says the enemy has 4,000 men, despite it actually being 4,200. This was due to what Kinemon said in chapter 955 while Conjuro was around. Kinemon says, and as of this moment, we have 4,000 at best, though it will not be a true all-out battle. And after that, a day later, they gained 200 more allies, but this time Kondra was not around to relay that information to Orochi. So with that small detail, Orochi had outdated information. There's not a single big foreshadowing moment, but it's a small collection of hints that add up to a great big reveal. So we've reached the end guys. There are more foreshadows for sure that Oda has done, but you have to let me know in the comment section if you'd like a part two to this video. If you would, drop a like, leave a comment, follow me on Twitter at BragoDAce, follow me on Instagram at BragoD.Ace. Thank you to my patrons, I appreciate you guys so much. guys. Be be sure to like and subscribe and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace. I start doubting me, I felt lost, I rewrite